All right, uh, we're here at Caltex TV with uh, we got Dante Atkins and we have uh, Russ Warner, candidate in the 26th uh, congressional district. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, you know, tell us about how the campaign's been going so far as we uh, head down here to the end of the first quarter and up towards the uh, the June primary. Okay. Uh, so far, it's gone very well. We've now raised uh, over a little over five hundred thousand dollars. And uh, that's four and a half times more than anyone has ever raised against David Dreyer in their entire campaign in the last 28 years. And uh, the endorsements keep coming in. We have 12 congressional from California, plus state and local. And uh, of course, for the first time, because of the hard work and the dedication, and, and I put together a really good campaign team. Uh, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee has now targeted David Dreyer for the first time in 28 years, and their top 40 national is beatable. And then they listed me as a candidate best to defeat him. And uh, so far, things just look really good, and we're running a real positive campaign and a very aggressive campaign. Great. Now, you actually had a primary this time. Uh, it just, well, you had a primary last time, but we, you weren't exactly probably expecting to have another primary this time. And then the last minute, uh, last cycle of nominee jumped back in. Uh, does that change how you're approaching the campaign at all? And if so, how? Well, actually, we, we anticipated that if anyone were to do it, uh, my opponent would do this at the last minute. So we were ready for it. And the only thing that's going to change is that we're going to use it to our advantage. Uh, we know we're going to spend a lot more money in the primary than what we would have normally have had to had we not had an opponent. But it'll work in our advantage as uh, we get more name recognition and things such as that. And that's what the primaries are all about. And uh, we're going to win this time. There's no doubt about it. I'm working way too hard, and I have the support of all the presidents of uh, the local Democratic clubs. Um, we have, uh, the press has been very friendly to us. Uh, we have the 12 congressional endorsements, and the money we've raised, uh, things just look really good. That's great. Um, as you're out there talking to voters, what do you find to be their, their core concerns right now in your district, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about the, the, the context, the terrain of your district, where, you know, what cities okay. and, and what, what that area is like. Well, uh, the city, the district goes from Rancho Cucamonga to La Cañada Flint Ridge, Montrose, and half of Altadena, and it follows mostly the 134 and the 210 freeway, and also goes down into Walnut and Arcadia, and it even goes up into Wrightwood. And there's seven registered Democrats uh, going from La Cañada Flint Ridge over to Victorville, someplace up there. We know where they are. And uh, uh, the district has changed immensely in the last 10 years. It's now 36% registered Democrat, 44% registered Republican, declined to states now 20%. And uh, the opening of the 210 freeway just had a, a rush of people from Pasadena and the west side moving out there. There's good schools in Rancho Cucamonga and Upland. And it's changed uh, for the benefit of uh, Democrats out there. And uh, the other half of your question, I'm trying to... Well, it's just the, what are the issues as you talk to the, people the out issue. there? What, what? The number one issue is the war in Iraq. And that's because this district is middle class and upper middle class. And I don't think the economy has quite affected them yet. But they recognize that the war is affecting them and it's going to eventually affect the economy in that district. And it has. And most of the people just haven't felt it yet. But it's definitely the war. And I think it's going to be education and, uh, and the economy. Uh, San Bernardino County, uh, where Rancho Cucamonga is, I used to live uh, in Riverside, uh, so I, I know that area uh, pretty well. And it's had a massive amount of expansion, but those are the that, those are the areas, and uh, Rancho Cucamonga is fast growing areas that are the hardest hit by uh, the foreclosure mess and by everything else. Uh, what is what do you tell these people that have lost their homes uh, when you're uh, obviously you've probably heard about this issue, but what do you tell them when you're campaigning? out in these areas, people that have lost their homes when they were told that they could just sell them for a profit? Well, I think that this situation is a lot more serious than we can even imagine. Uh, the homeless issue is going to get much larger because of this. And if any of you ever read about Tent City in Ontario, imagine two million people, I mean, two million homes being foreclosed upon around the whole country. That's going to be 3.1 million people, I mean, 3.1 person per home. By the time you're done, that's almost 7 million people. And what's caused this, um, I think, was greed. And I believe that the, uh, the uh, CEO and founder of, I believe it's Amiquest, which was an Orange County-based uh, firm, and he just recently passed away. 
he actually started this. And uh, he was, for his rewards and all that, he was uh, given an ambassadorship to uh, the Netherlands, I believe. And um, um, it's just a shame that these people have been able to get away with this. And I actually believe that they understood what they were doing. And I don't know if what they're doing in Washington, but they should do a thorough investigation of every single one of these companies to find out what laws were changed, how they rewrote those contracts to fool people. And they did. And a lot of those people, let's face it, this is, this is the United States. And when you put a contract in front of someone and you said, yes, you only make $75,000 a year, but we can put you in that $600,000 home. And this is what your payments are going to be, and you can afford it. Most people think that they just are the best day of their life. And it was wrong for them to do that. And I think these mortgage companies understood that, but they also knew and they hedged on it. I'm going to give myself as a perfect example. I bought another piece of property in another city. I have very good credit. And yet in my case, they came back to me and they said, Mr. Warner, your credit is really good, but you don't have enough bills. We have to charge you an extra half a point. And if you check with other people who have good credit, you're going to find out they were hedging all along. And they knew it. And then when it crashed, they want the government to bail them out. So what's your, your, your prescription for that? Do you think there should be a foreclosure moratorium? Do you think that the government needs to buy up some of these loans? Uh, what, what? Well, these mortgage companies profited very heavily, and if you read the papers about how much money some of the CEOs and that made as they left, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, um, I think it's a crime. And I think these mortgage companies should somehow have to pay back, or at least those that have these holdings right now, because they were sold. These were sold to other companies. They need to put a freeze on these because these people are going to lose their homes and there's no need for it. Let's just put a nice fixed interest rate on it, let everyone be happy. And if that doesn't happen, then that means to me that these mortgage companies want these homes foreclosed upon because they're only going to make more money on it in the future anyway. Um, how does your approach change when you're campaigning in your district? Uh, and more, from more conservative areas like Rancho Cucamonga, to other areas that may be uh, more of a progressive base, the you know Arcadia area or some of these uh, closer into Pasadena that might be a little more democratic. Does your message change? Do you have to take a different message to different areas? Or how do you go about reconciling that? I've been using the very same message. I'm against the war. I always have been against the war. Uh, matter of fact, I started uh, uh, the first Democratic club in Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, we also I stood on the corner for eight weeks and. and Foothill and Haven and Rancho Cucamonga, uh, stood there with great pride with about 60 or 70 other people. And uh, I recognized during that time period that the people were against the war. 60 to 65 percent of the people that came by were positive. And so we just kept going and going. And the message uh, throughout the whole district is that way. But also I'm a small businessman. And that district, in Rancho Cucamonga alone, there's almost 1,400 businesses that are listed with the Chamber of Commerce. And that's my message. I'm against the war. I believe in health care. I believe in better education. And I'm a small family business. And I believe the country should be run like a small family business. That's good. Uh, yes, that's you, good. Have, uh, you have a son serving in Iraq currently, correct? No, he's, he's here now. He's, he's Matter of fact, country. I should have brought him with me. He's uh, going to be campaigning with me now. Um, as I, I told everyone, uh, it was Greg who, uh, when he came home from leave, he and I had a father and son conversation about the war. And uh, when it was over, he turned and looked at me and said, Dad, if you really feel that way, why don't you run for Congress? I promised Greg I would. I'm now fulfilling that promise. And uh, he's going to be campaigning with me. And uh, I'm real proud to have him home. How many tours did he do? He was there 17 months and came only home for only two weeks. Uh, technically, he was one of the abused. He was a young recruit at that time, not a recruit, he actually volunteered and found out war was wrong. And um, uh, there were other people that were going over there and after three or four months they were, they were coming home every for two weeks. But after a year, I had to threaten on going to see my congressman or writing him a letter to see if my son could come home. My son went to his captain and said, my father's really concerned, he's upset, he's thinking about calling his congressman, which I would not like to do. But uh, the captain looked at him within a few minutes and goes, oh, you can go home next week. Wow. That was, well, they knew what they were doing. I mean, what, can, what, what do you think the Congress can do about that? Things like stop loss, things like, uh, you know, these, these extra deployments that are really uh, hollowing out the military at all levels. You know what, I, 
I think what this administration is doing is, is destroying this country from within. And unfortunately, you look at the military, you, we have our brave soldiers, Marines, and, and uh, Army personnel, and Navy personnel going over there. And they're making maybe $2,500, $3,500 a month to be in a war zone. They're fighting to end this war. And then you have someone like Blackwater, who's over there, and those people are making two and $300,000 a year. They're profiting from this war. They don't want it to end. I think the government, especially the Democrats, have to take hold of this because our all-volunteer army is being destroyed. And I don't think we need to have a paid army. And that's what I'm afraid could happen if this continues. A lot of soldiers are coming home, and they're not re -upping. Would you support uh, a, a ban on all private military contractors uh, in, in war? Absolutely. They have, no, they have no accountability, and yet you read in the paper where our, our soldiers, who's actually uh, losing their lives and, and suffering the wounds, they're the ones that when they make a mistake when under combat, they're the ones who are being put up on trial. And yet I've never, I don't think I've seen anyone from Blackwater, I may be mistaken, that's been put on trial or been uh, approached as doing something wrong. Explicitly, actually, are immune from prosecution. That's right. That's right. Um, talk about. I know there's something that, that you uh, spoke out about uh, at the time, which was the S chip legislation and, right. and, and David Dreyer's uh, uh, neglect uh, of the fact that he would, he did not vote uh, to expand S chip. So I know that was important to you. So I wanted to. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, education and healthcare go hand in hand, especially with our children. How can you expect them to learn if we can't get them to the doctor when they're sick and that? And I tell you, I, I, I know this because I came from a poor family. It was 1967 that my dad read the paper that we were now lower middle class, who was very proud. And I know what it was like in 1958, 57, when my dad brought home $58 a week, six kids. One of us was, yeah. <laughs> I mean, excuse me, not six kids, six people in the family. Oh, okay. Uh, I've lost two brothers and sisters someplace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, he would come, uh, let's say I would get sick. And an office visit to a doctor was only two or three dollars at that time. And then if you had to get a shot or you had to get medication, that might be another four or five dollars. So by the time you're done, you're taking a lot of money out of the family budget. And David Dreyer, too, have voted against that. And if you get on our website, warnerforcongress.com, you'll be able to hit the web uh, uh, ad, and you'll be able to see David Dreyer on the House floor saying, thank God the president is going to veto that S-chip bill tomorrow. That's just a shame. He was a man who probably never had to pay for medical care in his life, not one penny out of his own pocket. And he's up there telling Congress that, thank God, the president is going to veto this S-chip bill. As a matter of fact, we should have health care for everyone in this country. We're already paying for it, and people don't recognize that. If you look at the emergency rooms, a poor person can't go to their doctor, and they can't go to an urgent care center. So they're forced to go to the emergency rooms where they pay four and five times. Of course, they don't pay, but they, they're charged four and five times uh, what it would cost if they went to a doctor, a normal doctor. And those are actually hidden profit centers for these hospitals. And so if you had 12 million people going through those hospitals every year, the same as if they go to their doctor, times that by four. You're hitting the 48 million people in this country that don't have health care right now. Um, I was just uh, talking about uh, the CDP convention that we're having here. Uh, what do you expect getting uh, an endorsement from the California Democratic Party to do for your campaign? Um, it just makes it to where it's easier to help raise money. I'm the candidate that they want to win. And it also gives a lot of credibility to the, the district uh, that they have a real candidate who's running for Congress. And uh, uh, I think during the pre-endorsement it was 37 to 2. And I was very pleased with that. Of course, very nervous. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, but I sat there for two hours like everyone else, and when they started adding it up, I was very relaxed at the end. <laughs> But it, it will help, definitely help with endorsements and money, and then we also have the, uh, uh, like Eric Bauman, who will help me in the Los Angeles County sector with uh, probably mailers and robo-dialing or whatever he can. And Carol Robb out in San Bernardino will be doing the same thing in the San Bernardino County section, so it's, it's all very good. Talk about your, uh, your organizing strategy and, and how you're mobilizing and trying to find people, you know, that maybe hadn't voted uh, in prior elections. I mean, I, we know that you were 
in your seat, more Democrats voted in the uh, February 5th primary than Republicans. That's right. Um, you know, how do we make sure those people aren't one-time Obama voters or something, and uh, or Clinton voters? Because actually, your your district went very hard for Clinton. Um, uh, how do we find those people? Make sure they know about you, know your message, and and, and are going to. Speak? Well, I would think my district would go for Clinton because they want her to win. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Obama wins, we know he's going to pull more Democrats in office with him. He's also going to excite the base. People who may never have voted before are going to get out because they feel as if this is a part of history, uh, whether it be a woman or an African American. Uh, but I think Obama is going to pull more people in office with him, and I'm really excited about that. And uh, that district is it's a tough district, but it's very beatable out there. And I think Obama would take it if he had it. I'm going back to this because of what the Republicans are saying, go out and vote for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, there's there's like a significant amount of uh, sprawl in, in this. In this, It's not a very dense district. It's very spread right. out, right? You know, how do you make sure you can get on the ground and hit every house when, oh. when there's so many well, housing things? Yeah, we, we actually uh, put the headquarters in Monrovia, right on Foothill, almost right in between the district. It's only maybe a quarter of a mile off the, the 134 freeway. Uh, we've got uh, 12 phones in there, uh, plus we have this, any cell phones that want to come in. Uh, we're going to have remote phone banking. Uh, you can be on the space shuttle. If you want to, we can email you the script and you can call for us. We, we'd appreciate it. Are you that. trying to do that? If we could get someone up there to do one, I'd like to make history. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, uh, we have volunteers now calling in every day. Uh, we also have uh, Valley Grassroots and those organizations from the Valley. Uh, they believe that this is going to be the number one race in Southern California, if not possibly the whole state. And they're going to be coming out and they're going to be phone banking for us out there, either remotely or at the headquarters. Plus, they're going to be coming out and canvassing the area. We know we have to hit every home at least twice. Right. And that's what we intend to do just before the primary. Right. I, yeah, we got to wrap that up. Do you have anything? No, I'm Thanks, Russ. Okay, very good. Thank you.